let's kick this off. Thank you everybody for a fantastic day so far. Uh, I'm kind of overloaded with all of the awesomeness that has uh, happened today. I picked out my uh, favorite so far, I think, but uh, Louis, why don't you uh, give us a preview? What, what do you think were some of your uh, highlights for the day? Aside from your talk? Ha. Actually, I mean, oh, I man, really I enjoyed my the, the conversation. A, uh... Actually, no, I re actually that, that was probably the one I enjoyed the most. Um, you know, I, I kind of live, eat, and breathe service mesh. Um, and so it was just really interesting to hear kind of three different, you know, implementers of service mesh uh, agree on so many things uh, so vehemently. Uh, so that was, you know, that, that was definitely a highlight for me, covering, you know, obviously a lot of experience that you know, they had had with the different, you know, uh, deployments that they had tried to support for customers and what they had learned from that. Um, so that's obviously always super interesting for me. Um, another highlight, I think, uh, there was a talk uh, from the folks with the DOD. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully my audio is going to hold up. Um, but one thing that stood out for me was how they kind of integrated, you know, leveraging a higher level concept from the mesh as part of their GitOps, right? They, there was a feature where they, they would label deployments in Kubernetes and say that they wanted them to opt into SSO. Right? Like SSO is not a feature of any built-in built -in feature of any mesh, really. But it was something that they had built on top, and then they integrated it kind of end-to-end -end with the developer experience um, in a, a really powerful but kind of you know, bespoke way. Uh, but it delivered a great user experience. So that one kind of stood out. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's something that we've all been trying to achieve with Kubernetes and service mesh is kind of the next step, that like common environment, the idea that they are taking service mesh and getting it into satellites and uh, fighter jets and normal deployments is like one of the coolest things for me because you get this like common API that you can then build on top of. Uh, really exciting, you know, as we start to get this like cloud native world where the cloud isn't just an AWS data center anymore. It's anything, anywhere. It's really cool. Right. And they were also being super nice about like sharing all of these kind of practices by kind of creating templates for deployments and, you know, publishing them on Git for anyone else to use. Right. So that, that was, it was really nice to see your tax dollars at work. <laughs> uh, it, it highlights something that I think is awesome about service mesh that we don't spend a lot of time talking about is that a lot of where we are today as a community is building out the primitives that you can go build on top of like uh, with service mesh interface and traffic split. There's some awesome primitives that you can go do things with that we just haven't built yet. And Flagger is starting to do that with, you know, their kind of work and uh, like seeing the DoD release their configurations and the rest for those next level concerns is just so exciting. Yeah, yeah. So that, those are the things that stood out um, on the kind of the more user experience side of things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, always there's you know, a fair amount of detailed technical content. Um, and, and we had two talks today about Telco, which is mm -hmm. a good segue into asking Projecta what uh you know maybe what some of her highlights were for the day and actually um i was not si i was not silent by design it was just my stuff was echoing a lot but now that we got that fixed <clears throat> i do i was actually excited to see a whole bunch of new talks i think i mean both of you made great points the reason i'll tell you the motivation for doing the telco talk in the first place um Traditionally, we always assume telco, edge, enterprise, these are very different things and we treat them like individual silos. And I have half my background is enterprise and half my background is telco. And actually the problems to be solved are exactly the same. And the idea was to introduce these use cases to show that there's really common set of use cases we're all trying to solve. Sometimes the starting points might be different and sometimes the technologies might be slightly different, but 
when we really talk service mesh, like today in my slide, for example, I had about 12 plus implementations, including Kelsey's service mesh, and that was just half in jest. Uh, but I think the key part is that service mesh is here to stay. That's, that's what all these implementations show. Obviously, you've got Istio, which is immensely popular in the open source community. <clears throat> but each of these brings value to the community. And I think surfacing up how telcos can actually tap into it, even if they have legacy systems <clears throat> or if their stuff runs on VMs. That, that is the, the uh, paradigm has to adapt to the use case and not the other way around. So I think it just showed to me also another thing that we need to keep expanding the bounds of what service mesh is and does. And uh, so that was the motivation behind doing the talk. And <clears throat> I just wanted to add Actually, my observation on the other talk, which was uh, done from by Ericsson, and this was Gabor who was doing the Gabor Retwari from Ericsson. I was actually excited to see because he picked up a really legacy uh, thing, which is the session border controller. It is as legacy as you can get in some ways. Uh, he picked up a protocol that is not HTTP based. So he picked up RTP over UDP. And then he started laying out how, you know, we, when we look at it from a cloud native lens, we are seeing everything HTTP, WebSocket, gRPC based. That is not the real world in telco. So how do we bridge these things? Uh, then he talked about the profile, like one is long weighted, one is short lived, talked about KPIs. But then he went back to the commonness, which is service mesh is nothing but separating control and data plane of services. And then if we can figure out how to bridge some of these nuances, Every bit of what we talk about in service mesh, whether it's traffic control, whether it's security, whether it's observability, scale out, all of those are equally relevant and obviously a lot more work to be done there. But I was super excited to see that talk. Uh, me too. Uh, in fact, um, we, we haven't implemented it yet in Linkerd, but uh, by far the two most uh, exciting protocols that I want to see are uh, MySQL and uh, Kafka so that you bridge this like traditional HTTP microservices world into a bunch of different paradigms because in the end, we're all trying to solve the same problem. It just happens that protocols are unique to our uh, problem spaces, which is a pretty cool way to look at it. Yeah, no, the, uh, uh, that was definitely interesting. Sorry, Lewis, keep on going. Oh, my audio is a bit laggy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, HTTP is obviously the, the kind of early sweet spot for meshes, right? It's, it's the most widely used protocol. It's the protocol that's most used by the people that we targeted first, right? Kubernetes users building kind of distributed apps in a kind of microservices paradigm, right? HTTP. REST, JSON, gRPC, and things that it will dominate there. But yeah, I mean, MySQL, Kafka, you know, uh, you know, other kind of database protocols, you know, Postgres, um, JDBC, right? There's a very, very long list. And a lot of these protocols have a lot in common, right? Um, there are generally speaking only a few different shapes of protocols out there, um, you know, Kind of command body oriented ones, things that have are more resource oriented, and then almost all of them have headers of some form. Um, so one interesting challenge and something we've been talking about in the history community is, um, you know, abstracting the kind of the the encoding details of the protocol a little bit from the, the kind of routing and feature extraction aspects as it would relate to telemetry, um, so that you could design APIs for routing and other things, which is something that's a big part of service mesh. Um, and then have those APIs apply to many protocols as long as they could map into a certain set of well-known paradigms. Um, it's an interesting design challenge and it, you know, it's not something that we've shipped or made a ton of progress on, but it's something that I, I think about a lot. Like if, if I look at the Kafka protocol or I look at Stomp or something else, right, I, I see a lot of similarities between that and other protocols that we have pretty good support for. Um, and if you look at a lot of the HTTP routing stuff that exists, a fair amount of it is pretty generalizable to other protocols. Right? Match headers with regexes, prefix suffix match, um, path is just really a special type of header, query params are headers passed in something else. 
right? You, you, it, it's pretty easy to come up with generalizations. Um, so I think that will be an interesting space. Uh, and, and if we lay the foundation for that pretty well, then you know it, it might be easy to expand the universe of supported protocols pretty quickly. And those same things apply to policy and telemetry, right? Those same kind of sets of attributes. Um, so that's an area that I think you know I would certainly like to see some exploration of by the community over the next year. Oh, hundred percent. Me too. And it's it's always the trade offs there in particular that like. Do you want to, how general can you get before you start losing fidelity? Like you don't want to do something that is a hundred percent unique just to Kafka because there are general generic important uh, abstractions you can pick there. But on the other side, you don't want to lose all of the important information that you get out of that. Like if you start talking about policy, policy that I would love to write someday is the ability for uh, limiting select statements on MySQL at the service mesh level, which is a pretty interesting, like super unique integration with the actual protocol. But like, how do you make sure that the extensibility is there without actually uh, having to do a special implementation each time? Um, I, I yeah. think this or, actually or goes into, kind of... sorry about that. I was gonna say that. The other canonical example I have here is, you know, send select requests the read replicas of MySQL and send inserts and updates to the master, right? I mean, there's a, a pretty, mm -hmm. you know, lots of people who've scaled out SQL have written proxies to do just that. Um, so those are super powerful in, use cases for enterprise. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a plugin that exists for Linkerd one where uh, it'll do automatic sharding for you, which is really cool uh, in my mind. Um, this actually, I think, uh, leads directly into a question, um, or not a question, but uh, one of the other talks, which was the WASM talk, which got me super excited. The ability to go and start writing and doing prototype on top of the proxy itself with WASM opens up the world so that we can actually do a little bit of experimentation to figure out what the generic uh, implementations are, where the right abstractions are, and having that really powerful WASM tool so that we can experiment and figure out what we want to go and make a more concrete solution is super duper exciting to me. Actually, I would yeah, add yeah. to that because, uh, I mean, just adding to what you were saying, Thomas, we see, um, you know, there are these requirements for customization. And uh, I think Christian, who did the talk from solo.io, he called out several of those needs, including, for example, you need new wire protocols, or you want your own custom metrics, or maybe you want to implement custom security exchanges, maybe because you've not upgraded. Um, lots of things around header, header message transformation. Um, firewalls and so on and so forth. I think WASM, custom filters, this level of customization is also important to help vendors of products plug in to things without really going and touching the core framework of a service mesh paradigm, right? So it gives them a way to put in their proprietary stuff uh, in a way that we preserve the paradigm and what it stands for. <clears throat> and also preserving a lot of the openness that comes from, for example, following an XPS protocol for talking to Envoy. So to me, that was, I think it is a very key area. It's relatively new, um, but I was excited to see uh, their demo. It was pretty nice. And then he talked about the web assembly hub, which was an interesting concept. I think it was about the community coming together to share stuff. Uh, broadly, I think WASM will open up use cases um, that we would have normally otherwise struggled to implement. Obviously, we need to make sure we make it production grade and we all put resources into it, but it's a great uh, area for the community to collaborate on as well. Louis, I know you had some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't know. Uh, it took me a second, but uh, when I was watching the, the talk on security from VMware, um, mm. in their diagrams, they, they were using the logo from WASM. Uh, I was. I, I didn't get a chance to follow up with a guy uh, and ask him a question on Slack, but uh, you know that 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 use case, right? That that integration use case. I got the impression from their diagram that that's what they were doing. Uh, I know VMware has a a, a broad portfolio of security products. Um, they certainly acquired a number of companies in that space over the course of the last eighteen months. I think so. Clearly, that's an important thing for them to be able to bring that portfolio into their service mesh product. Uh, and, and it looked, at least from the diagram, that they were going to think, 
be thinking about using WebAssembly to do it. So that was kind of exciting. Uh, it was nice to see. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. I thought both the the experimentation phase, but also moving from experimentation to implementation, or um, also being able to segregate functionality. Uh, I think there was a, a conversation I have fairly often with Matt Klein is, you know, there's a lot of built-ins in proxies, right, and in Envoy too. Right? They have plugins for a variety of protocols that probably have low usage in aggregate. Um, those plugins represent a security risk, right, if you're not actually using that code. And, and Matt is quite eager to get those plugins out of the core and into a, an ecosystem of, you know, stable uh, but separate plugins that people can choose to use. And, you know, for, for really big deployments or very security sensitive enterprises, uh, you know, only configure and take dependencies on what you actually use is a pretty important thing. And so if, if WebAssembly can help fulfill that promise too, I think it will be very valuable. I think this actually loops back to uh, Mitch and my talk as well in that uh, WASM also really provides us as service mesh implementers a really unique uh, tool to keep our service meshes light and fast because when uh, users who have totally valid user requests come and ask for something that's very specific to their environment, we can say, hey, you know, that's a really awesome user request. Why don't you implement it in WASM yourself? This isn't something that needs to go into the core service mesh and potentially reduce security or increase the um, amount of tests and all of the rest of that. Because it's a small pluggable piece, we have a lot more freedom in what the service mesh does and doesn't and being able to define that, which is also super exciting. Actually, since we are talking about your Thomas stock, Thomas, we should we should talk more about your talk because I personally really enjoyed that talk. I liked the fact that, um, you know, you had, obviously there was you, but there was um, Sabine from, uh, she was there from console side, and then we had Mitch from Istio. And um, I liked the fact that, you know, it was interesting for me to see that you all brought, brought some very similar and some very different points of view. And I liked the fact that, you know, each of you was very open to the other's point of view. Um, I would say all of your conversation, like, for example, Mitch brought up the whole issue of Istio control plane simplification. And uh, you said an interesting thing where service mesh is not really about technology. It's about people. That really resonated with mm -hmm. me. It's really about that. Obviously, we need to make things more simpler. But broadly, it is really about solving that problem. And then I like the fact that Consul, Sabine from Consul came up with a different angle around how they didn't want to be an APM product and then how they went about it. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I saw the theme around WASM in all of your conversations as well. Um, it seems that you folks are also putting a lot of emphasis on the user experience. And I think broadly as a community in our own open source as well as uh, managed implementations, we should keep that in mind. Um, and then I think uh, there, there was some lots of, there, were, there was a lot of uh, mesh humor, I should say. I'm going to steal some of those lines, but I, really like the three perspectives. So for example, when there was an issue, um, you know, how does Istio deal versus it, with it versus console versus Linkerd? And I think you spoke about taps and Wireshark's and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I just I just love that talk from the, for the fact that um, I think we spend too much time thinking about how different we are. I love the fact that you brought three different perspectives and you raised some really good issues that all of us across the board can use and bring into our own implementation. So, so just thank you for that talk, Louis. I know you you like oh, that you... one. Sorry, go ahead, Thomas. I was going to say, Yvette. Uh, I think I think the fun thing for me is how much uh, we end up riffing on each other. Uh, like a, a really great example is the um, original uh, Istio init container code. Um, we borrowed heavily on the uh, Linkerd side of things. Um, and now Istio has gone and, and picked up a lot of our check infrastructure, which is great. Like it's super fun for me being part of the ecosystem just to see when you do something that's really great, everyone goes and picks it up and adopts it. And that's awesome. It makes me so happy because we can go and pick the things that are unique to us and go double down on that and have the rest of the community build out really great solutions that work for everybody. 
Awesome. Louis, I know you listened to that talk as well. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I very much enjoyed that talk. The, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a transition going on, I think. Um, I, I, it's kind of this, this crossing the chasm moment. Because um, the, the kind of proof of that was that there were talks by people who had gone through real deployment struggles, persisted, become familiar with the tools, and gotten real demonstrable value from the deployment. Uh, there was a talk about uh, provisioning machine learning stuff from uh, Splunk, uh, which was a, a, a great kind of classic you know, user experience and value derived kind of talk where there was you know, struggle in the middle. Right? Mm -hmm. our, our, our hero had to go through a process, uh, but ultimately came out victorious. Um, and it's nice to see more of those kinds of talks at these types of events. And, uh, I, I think we're starting to see that frequency go up. Uh, and part of that is about people. Um, right? Service mesh is a, other than the fact that it's a terrible term because it doesn't describe what it does, but then most terms in computers aren't descriptive. I think we're getting to the point where there's enough critical mass of people who understand the value that are able to bring that value into their organization and explain it to other people who don't necessarily understand it yet. But when they can show the value in the context of their own business, right, that's when the light bulbs really start to go on. And I think we're starting to see more of that. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I hate being in the realm of prognostications, but I, I feel a lot better about that than I did, say, at the beginning of 2020. Um, despite it being 2020, um, so that, that 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 was particularly encouraging for me. And you know, that that kind of that conversation that you and uh, we're all having about your different experiences also kind of reinforced that for me a bit because you were seeing the same things from users. You were explaining the same context uh, uh, solutions. You know, sometimes taking slightly different approaches to the same problem space, but mostly seeing the same problems and and working hard to address them because you were in engagements, right? You were doing that work because customers were asking you for help, right? Which is a, a good place to be as a, as a product, as a technology, as a, an open source project. Um, so that was, that was kind of, that was why I liked that talk so much, I think. A hundred percent. In fact, I think it's, it's like almost it. a, uh, almost a theme that we had from today is this like real world use cases that are concrete, you know, talking about, telco and the interesting unique problems that comes from that and why a common service mesh pattern can work there uh the machine learning and you know making something that maybe was originally just for microservices work there and going through the hero's journey and figuring out how to have it all fit together the multi-cluster talk was fantastic how to you know go and make this a globally distributed system um talking about the security pieces how, what the dod worked through like it, it very much was this here's a concrete application of these generic patterns and primitives that work for everybody which gets me insanely excited on a regular basis yeah i think i mean i would just I echo that in Great, great points. And I think maybe, you know what we should do, we've got five minutes. We should maybe recap our takeaways of the day. I think it would be great also later to talk to folks over chat and see what they thought of the day. But um, I'll just summarize mine. And I do think, I mean, you touched on some of the talks we didn't necessarily dive into, but multi-cluster is important. And in fact, multi everything is important. Multi-cluster, multi-region, multi -cluster, multi, -region, multi -region. Um I think broadly, there was one interesting thing said today, which is service mesh, everybody agrees, is key to reducing complexity of applications. But I think each one of us needs to manage the complexity of the service mesh implementations themselves. So we need to work on making the implementation simpler to consume. And we should think like a user and not like somebody who's building a distributed system or some, some piece of infrastructure. Um, debugging was another theme that came up in several talks. I think, for example, Istio seemed to be the flavor of the day, but I think there were also lots of interesting suggestions about 
are doing better on the debugging side. Then I would say number of service mesh implementations, I think the market will decide. And I think the key takeaway for me there is service mesh is here to stay. Uh, we need to make our things simpler, better. Uh, security, I heard uh, the last statement in the DOD talk, which was mesh is key to security. I love the fact that Tetrade and DOD got together and they solved the use case from a customer's perspective, which was DOD in this case. Um, I think the same thing, uh, in fact, Kunal in my talk drives our relationships with AT&T and other big telcos. And that's why we opened our talk so he could give a customer, he's, he's like the voice of customer here. Um, and hopefully we keep that customer perspective. I would say as I would just say as a, as a community, we should really think of all of the significant collaboration opportunities that surfaced up today. Sometimes I feel like we spend far, far too much time talking about our differences, not so much about the things we could do together. And I think the latter far outweighs the former. And I would say we should keep expanding the definition of mesh. Let's support our open source communities like Istio, Kuma, LinkedIn, whatever is out there, let's go support that. And I think, um, you know, for us, we will continue to bring the best of Google into our managed solutions like Traffic Director, Antho Service Mesh, and with a lot of humility, because we are also learning in this journey from all of you, from customers. So we look forward to collaborating. And with that, I'll hand off to Thomas and Louis. Would love to hear what you have, what you took away from the day. I'll, I'll actually just put a, a little um, blurb in here, which is, uh, We'd love to work with everyone in Service Mesh Interface to go and build out that API and the common patterns and use cases there. So if folks want to uh, jump over to the SMI Slack channel and chat with us there, show up at our community meetings. Uh, we'd love to work with expanding out what those APIs mean, what the core problems that Service Meshes solve are, and you know, moving that discussion forward. Um, since I'm talking, I'll, I'll give my uh, two cents. Uh, Multi-cluster was a theme. It was a great takeaway. I love getting together and hearing, again, the use cases, what everybody's up to, and the differing perspectives. It's why uh, we had the talk that we did to chat about the trade-offs and understand it. I had one of the funnest days putting that together just because it's so much fun to chat through how all the pieces fit together. And like, I have so many blind spots. It's fun to see the elephant from someone else's perspective, for sure. Uh, Louis, how about you? Yeah, so we, we all had the, the privilege of watching the talks yesterday, and so you know, I, I got to spend uh, you know some time thinking about what my my, my takeaways would be. Um, the first, which is common experience, right? We are you know, the different service mesh implementations are mostly seeing the same set of requirements from uh, their users. Uh, there's a lot of commonality there, um, which in indicates that the, the kind of base set of features that uh, service meshes present are pretty well entrenched now in the minds of you know, the potential users, and um, to some degree, they're looking for consistency. Um, I think we're just starting to hit the, the you know the early adopter waves, and then you know, the, the kind of the second wave of enterprise and then the third wave will probably be of meeting all the needs of enterprise, right? Because, you know, land and expand is often a phrase used in enterprise sales, right? Um, when you're an open source project, uh, you know, you, a lot of these projects, they're, you know, going to be put under pressure to start moving out and covering more of those scenarios that are important to enterprises with the same set of properties, right? Whether it's expanding the set of protocols, whether it's expanding the set of environments, um, and, and, and possibly other things too. It's hard to speculate because there are so many different integrations that enterprises want to do. Uh, that's great. That indicates a degree of maturity, but it's also a big challenge, right? As a if you talk about customizability and extensibility, I, I used to work in a classical enterprise software company before I, I worked at Google, and, and customization often caused people to run screaming for the hills if they had worked before on systems like SAP, which were endlessly and infinitely customizable. Um, so that, that challenge, that platform versus product challenge, and, and where to draw a line between those two things for these products is going to be a challenge. 
Um, it's a great challenge to have because it means you have things that people want you to do, but it's hard to get right. Uh, and we'll probably get it wrong several times before we get it right. Um, you know, Istio has already had a couple of stabs at it in a couple of different ways, and we've learned from those mistakes. Um, and I expect that we'll, we'll keep doing that, uh, and we'll see which patterns the industry is willing to accept and which ones it isn't. Uh, and I think that's going to be a big part of 2021. That sounds great. I think we're just about out of time, but there was uh, there a few questions in the chat. Are, are we going to take those over on Slack, or are we going to just try and do them now? Let's see. So there was, there was a question about the Looks. hardcore open stack stuff and telcos and what's motivating <coughs> telcos to look at mesh and Kubernetes. Uh, Projector Singh, as you talked a lot about telco, what, what is causing a change in the telco industry? Why is this relevant? And I think um, one of the key things to remember is service mesh is not tied to Kubernetes. Service mesh is agnostic to compute, right? A good service mesh implementation should support containers and VMs. So even if telcos have open stack VMs, at the service mesh level, like we should be able to support services that come out of open stack as well as um, that are orchestrated through your CAS. And I would say, in fact, the ability to put policy uniformly across Kubernetes and a VM based services is one of the big reasons that we can actually start helping telcos migrate towards uh, and then help them adopt service mesh architecture. So, um, in fact, in our talk, we spoke about a use case called cap grow drain, which describes this exact thing. Like how, how do you manage your VM or open stack based deployments and your Kubernetes deployments by using the service mesh layer to treat them more consistently? So I, I would say that is the key, right? We should not assume service mesh is only for containers. It is compute agnostic. It should work on containers, VMs and bare metal. I think we answered, or, or Kevin was just agreeing with that, that statement about using uh, WebAssembly for the VMware stuff that I think we covered. Uh, and then a pitch for SMI and, and federation between meshes, um, which is a very interesting subject. Uh, I think that uh, in your conversation with Consul, uh, there was some good uh, discussion of some of the bootstrapping aspects of Federation, but I, I think we're going to have to move this conversation over to Slack at this point. So I just wanted to thank, thank you, everyone. For time. I was, you know, go ahead, Thomas. I, All yours. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for their time, and you know, uh, it, it's always good to be involved in these events. I, I know it's a little difficult being remote, but uh, I, you know, I found a lot of the content very informative. It was great to see some of the dialogues, some of the use cases, um, examples of user perseverance and success in particular. That's always heartwarming. Um, and you know, it's just an opportunity to talk to peers in the industry and you know, folks I don't see on an everyday basis. Likewise, thank you, everyone.